Hello, uh, here today at Open Forum is uh, Jessica Berlin, uh, a security and foreign policy uh, expert who's here in Kiev. Uh, and we're going to talk about um, communication. Communication of our urgent needs, uh, the needs that Ukraine um, tries to convey to uh, foreign partners, to the international coalition uh, supporting Ukraine in this uh, war that Russia unleashed against our state. Hi, Jessica, and thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Uh, well, first of all, we well, may know that Zelensky administration and the president personally have been praised widely for their uh, successful efforts to rally the world to help us, to send us weapons, uh, to sanction Russia, and do uh, their utmost to bring this war to an end. Um, we are also aware that uh, this critical strategic communication is a dynamic process that needs to be adjusted from time to time, depending on political circumstances in uh, other countries and on the developments on the battlefield. Uh, so what is your personal assessment of our government's efforts uh, to this end to promote Ukraine's interests? Well, the Ukrainian government has done an outstanding job in communicating the needs and the urgency of the situation. A lot of uh, my friends and colleagues here in Ukraine, um, they're actually less critical of NATO support for Ukraine um, than myself and uh, friends and colleagues from other NATO member states, because from their viewpoint um, at the beginning of the full-scale invasion, it looked like they were going to be left to fend for themselves. That was back when uh, when NATO was sending javelins and uh, small weapons. And so the fact that we've come this far is really a testament to the uh, political and diplomatic and communications efforts of uh, the Ukrainian government. And that, of course, having been supplemented and really carried by the raw courage and ingenuity of the Ukrainian people and armed forces uh, in showing what is at stake in this war and that uh, that Ukraine will fight and will not surrender. I think that is really um, that was really the driving force um, that that helped mobilize so much public and political support from from Western states and around the world. Oh, by the way, yesterday our president convened uh, the uh, representatives of the diplomatic corps and he spoke extensively about their critical role in these efforts. Uh, to rally support, to get other governments, other leaders on our side uh, in this conflict. And uh, I was wondering, what is your opinion on uh, the ways our diplomats should work uh, with foreign governments, with foreign, with their colleagues abroad? Uh, what is better, a hardline diplomacy like our former ambassador to Germany, Mr. Melnik, was pursuing or is it better to uh, stick to a softer touch uh, agenda? Uh, what do you think is better in these times of war? Well, there's no one size fits all approach. It's not so black and white. The, the short, simple answer would be, it depends. It depends on who you're talking to. It's, and it depends what you're asking for, what the strategic goal in the given situation is. Um, to take the, the example uh, you gave of Ambassador Milnik in Germany, uh, for example, his approach at the beginning of the war, or at the beginning of the full-scale invasion, was, was very effective, uh, he, and rightly so. Uh, he was being told on and off record that Ukraine didn't stand a chance. He had been ignored uh, and belittled by, by the German uh, political establishment. And so uh, by forcefully calling out uh, and, and sharing details of some of those conversations and, and pushing, that was helpful at the beginning to, to mobilize. However, you know, again, as an example of how one size doesn't fit all, um, as the months progressed, it became counterproductive because within the political context and communication political uh, culture of Germany and of German politics and media, uh, after a certain amount of time, that kind of aggressive um, sort of hectoring tone was being ignored. And so serious messages were getting lost because the messenger was no longer being perceived as serious. 
And so this is where, you know, any, any ambassador, any minister, uh, any advocate for Ukraine, whether they're in, inside or outside of government, they need to read the room. They need to be willing to always reassess their own tone and strategies. And again, the question is always, what's my goal here? Um, it's always better to be effective than to just be right. And, and so I think now, especially as natural donor fatigue and uh, shall we say attention span fatigue sets in uh, in a lot of Western capitals and amongst uh, a lot of Western voters. Uh, Ukraine needs to be actively and proactively adjusting their communication strategy and, and also being willing um, rather than to, to fear and, and complain about donor fatigue to understand this is normal this happens in any conflict um, or in any crisis, um, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Asia, people tune out from bad headlines after a while. And so um, rather, rather than despair at that and think, oh no, this means that people aren't going to care anymore and aren't, and aren't going to support us anymore. No, it's not as bad as that. It just means that we need to, to adjust um, and to consider what is the goal um, what do we need now and how do we communicate this in a way um, that doesn't just get tuned out because it sounds like the same messages people have been hearing for the last year and a half. Well, I, I would actually like to dwell more on this topic of potential or ongoing fatigue, as you say. Uh, what is your opinion on um, whether this voter's fatigue or donor fatigue can eventually grow into a political fatigue. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think that politicians in the West are growing, uh, growing into thinking that this war must be must be over as soon as possible because we're just you know we're tired of it. We're investing too much. We're uh, helping Ukraine too much. We're uh, we're feeling that mm -hmm. our voters are tired of it. So, what do you think? In what countries, maybe maybe have some examples? This fatigue is most felt at the moment, and in what countries there are signs that this fatigue mm -hmm. is approaching, and what can be done about that to prevent that from mm -hmm. uh, developing? Well, it's it's a huge question with a lot of components, so I'll, I'll try to break it down. Uh, firstly, to what you said about um, people being being concerned that the war needs to end right away. Okay, if the war needed to end as soon as possible in the eyes of Western capitals then the way forward is clear. Send more help, full stop. If you want this war to be over ASAP, give Ukraine the long range missile systems, the ammunition and the air support capacity, the jets that you need to succeed. Uh, right now, Ukrainian armed forces are being asked to conduct a counteroffensive across a thousand plus kilometer heavily mined uh, entrenched defensive front without air superiority. This is something that no NATO military would ever even consider. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, madness, really, from a military strategic pr perspective if you're a NATO uh, military planner. But this is precisely what NATO is expecting of the Ukrainian armed forces. So anybody uh, who is complaining that it's going too slowly well, the answer is clear. We need to send more help more quickly. Demining equipment, long range missiles, air support capacity. Um, secondly, um, with the public, with, with voters, um, the good news is, um, and I'll, I'll speak to Germany and the US because I'm a, I'm a German and American um, citizen. So from, from the perspective of my countries, the good news is that public support, there is still a clear majority of, of support for Ukraine and for sending weapons um, and other aid to Ukraine. Um, and especially in the context of the upcoming US election, I know there's a lot of concern about the Republican Party and the potentiality of a Trump candidacy, um, but also more than 50% of Republican voters are in favor of support for Ukraine. So this is good news. Um, what we do need to see in the medium term will be more battlefield successes. 
Now that's not going to happen right now. Uh, you, you know, this as as referenced, the front is long and deeply defended and heavily mined, so it's going to take time. But the communications on that side need to be, I think, centered around giving people the context to understand that any overnight success that they saw on the telly last year um, with the liberation of, of Kharkiv and uh, the Russian retreat from Kherson, those overnight successes took months, you know? Uh, and for a lot of everyday folks watching the news, um, they're not following it in the intimate detail um, that, that people like we are. But when they see those headlines, they think, oh, great, wow, go Ukraine. They did that so fast. And now there's this sense of, oh, what's taking so long? And um, the message there just needs to be the combination of, I think, practical reminders that it's taking a long time because Ukraine didn't get the support and the equipment and the munitions they needed in time to deploy them in the first phase, uh, uh, first phases of this counteroffensive. And secondly, also, I, I think it's helpful to give historical context. Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, have have these images of uh, World War II as a reference point in their mind. And the example I always like to use is, you know, the Allied uh, invasion of Normandy on D-Day. You know, this this historic, heroic moment and victory that ultimately led to victory in Europe, Allied victory in Europe. Um, that didn't just happen in a day. After they stormed the beach, it took months to liberate all of Normandy, and it took a whole nother year almost to end the war. So I think the message from there for, for both the public and everyday people, everyday citizens um, in, in NATO member states, as well as our politicians and media landscape, is that these things take time. And it's normal in war to have setbacks, um, especially under the conditions that Ukraine are fighting. But if we persevere, if we keep our eye on the prize, our focus, and we speed our assistance, we will speed Ukraine's overall victory. But just like Nazi Germany didn't fall in a day or a month, uh, you know, this, uh, this battle won't just, be, won't just be won in a day. So we need to be patient. Well, you, you touched upon a little bit on uh, Donald Trump supporters and on the fact that 50% uh, of Republican voters stand for continued support mm -hmm. to Ukraine. Still, there are concerns here in Ukraine, of course, among average Ukrainians and experts, mm -hmm. that uh, a potential shift may happen in the public perception of this war should the, a Republican candidate among, like we have some of them who speak at the moment, at the time, like before, way before the elections. They speak uh, about changing the United States attitude to this war, their engagement to this conflict. So, uh, concern here in Ukraine is whether those candidates, should they win the election, um, stick to their agenda that they have right now, or is there a chance that they may make a U-turn actually, and once they take office, just, you know, continue with supporting Ukraine just because it is a logical thing to do from the standpoint of a uh, world champion in defending democracy. Mm -hmm. So what is your opinion given that you know some parts of American political kitchen? Right. Well, it's a legitimate concern. Uh, a lot of elements in the Republican Party these days are simply no longer rational actors. So I'm not going to try to predict the future or their future behaviors uh, because they're not following a logic um, and they're not even following a you know Republican philosophy really anymore. Um, I had to smile when you say you know Ukraine is the defender of, of freedom and democracy because this is kind of that hoorah American thing that that you would think Republicans would really be behind but um, um, somehow that sort of Reagan era Republicanism and notion of patriotism has, has flown out the window with a large section of the party. Uh, and that's bad news for everyone. Uh, but the good news is, I mean, there are a lot of folks, including Trump supporters within the party, Lindsey Graham, Senator Graham being a, a notable example, um, who are also very pro-Ukrainian. They, um, 
you know, there's that, that generation of, of Republicans who, even if now um, they've sort of uh, given up a lot of their principles and standards to support Donald Trump, uh, they're still veterans of the Cold War. And uh, not liking Russia and not trusting Russia is sort of in their political DNA. So that is, uh, that is, a, that is a, a small glimmer of hope. And I think the second piece is also, again, getting back to the battlefield realities. Americans like a winner, uh, as simplistic as that sounds. And uh, it's, it's a combination of being able to show, look, uh, we're helping Ukraine. We've been helping Ukraine. Um, the Russians are crazy bastards and we can help Ukraine win, and Ukraine is winning, and they're an underdog. You know, these kinds of narratives um, can appeal um, in that sort of, you know, simple messaging, I think, to, um, to a lot of folks and to help basically the Republicans who understand what's at stake in this war um, to speak to their people in terms that they can relate to um, and, and to continue supporting Ukraine, or at the very least, to not go anti-Ukraine. You know, I, I think that's really, really the goal here. The fact that some people will lose interest um, and not be gung ho supporters, like we can live with that. What we, what we can't have is um, someone who is actively hostile to Ukraine, like Donald Trump, um, turning public opinion actively against Ukraine. That would be madness. Um, on a, on the political level, targeting politicians, um, I think. And this applies um, to both Republicans, but actually especially Democrats um, and the Biden administration. Um, there's a strong sense that they view, they're more concerned about the implications of a swift and chaotic Russian defeat and collapse and, and how that would Im impact China and strengthen the Chinese regional and, and global position, um, then they're concerned about uh, the implications of what Russian, Russia coming out of this war with a status quo or even a small net benefit, the, the negative implications of that um, to, to uh, global security um, and to the Chinese um, position and perception of, of NATO power or lack thereof. Um, I think they've, they've got it backwards, quite, quite frankly. Um, and the fact that, that they've drawn this conclusion that it'll be better for Russia to land softly out of this disastrous um, and horrific war, um, they've drawn the wrong conclusion. Russia needs to lose and lose badly. Russia needs to crawl out of Ukraine on their knees begging for mercy. That's what the Chinese need to see. That's what the Saudis need to see. That's what every dictator on the planet needs to see to ensure that they don't get any ideas themselves. Because if what they see is, oh, Russia is allowed to invade a democratic European country, literally on the borders of NATO, to butcher senselessly tens of thousands of people, uh, to threaten global food security, uh, to, to cause refugee crises, to, ca to cause the kind of destruction we haven't seen on this continent since World War II. If they're allowed to get away with this in the 2020s and then get back to business, well, then nothing's going to stop the Chinese uh, from attacking Taiwan um, or from pressing forward in the South China Sea, etc. Because NATO will have shown that we cannot even keep the peace in our own front garden. Um, and, and that is much more dangerous than internal political chaos uh, in Russia uh, would be. So for this, I think um, as much as um, we, we must continue to, to hear um, the stories of the war crimes and the calls for justice, we, we must continue to, to hear and share those stories. But the truth is the hard realpolitik uh, situation is that those stories and accounts are not going to change the strategy of the Biden administration or of the Scholz administration for that matter um, on these issues. Their perception of, of the Chinese threat um, and the implications of a Russian collapse or too hard defeat of Russia will only 
be be influenced at a, at a strategic level and not on the human rights level. Um, so this would also be an area um, where I think um, Ukraine can and should and indeed is, you know, reaching out more to the global south, um, looking more at the geopolitical long term strategic implications of this war, because even though this, the, the suffering, the fighting, the dying is happening on Ukrainian soil, the implications of this war are truly global. This war, this conflict shapes our century and what we do or don't do uh, will, will determine the, the rest of, of our geopolitical arrangement for the next generations. So um, that was a very long answer <laughs> to, to well, what... Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, when you say that uh, okay, in Germany and, and the rest of Western Europe, in the European Union, let's say, they also uh, have the perception that the threat of Russia collapsing and potentially uh, new, uh, uncontrolled, um, not understandable states emerging with the with the nuclear bombs, you know, their arsenal, mm. Israel, yeah, for sure. Europe. But uh, and we sort of understand that, mm -hmm. and uh, we try to focus on uh, delivering the message that it's not probably the worst thing in this war because the implications are uh, critical for for the for the entire world. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the food prices and energy prices mm -hmm. and, and so on, and migration flows. But what about Africa? You've been an expert in Africa for more than a decade, and you can probably say more about how we can reach out to African countries to make them shift, like not all of them, but many of them, to shift their attitudes to this war in general, to Russia, which many of them perceive as, if not a savior, then, oh, then truly a helper that uh, is in contrast with, uh, with the Europe, with the big Europe that uh, they have... Um, bad memories about uh, standing back to the colonial times. Sure. Uh, we, we saw extensive efforts by our Ministry of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. to rally their support there in Africa, our minister toured the continent, mm -hmm. and uh, we had uh, our president speak with African leaders as well. What do you think is missing probably in this communication? What should be added or fixed, or maybe something is being done the right way uh, to get more support from Africa? Sure, that's a really important question. Um, firstly, the, the efforts and the increased focus and outreach uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the President's Office here, it's been really great to see. And uh, it's just the beginning. You know, to be completely fair, both to Ukraine and to African states, uh, there's, there's really uh, obvious, clear historical reasons why relations aren't closer and the networks aren't larger and the familiarity isn't there. I mean, Ukraine as an independent state is just about 30 years old. And you guys were understandably busy with other things and not out there, you know, making a global diplomatic footprint in the 90s and noughties while you were building your democracy and just emerging from, from Soviet rule. Um, so that makes perfect sense. And of course, the Russian Federation inherited all the diplomatic, business, and military ties uh, between the Soviet Union and uh, African countries um, that, that were built up during the Cold War, during which, of course, the Soviet Union supplied uh, lots of weapons and agricultural exports and money to uh, African liberation movements. Um, and the, uh, for example, in South Africa, of course, the anti-apartheid uh, fight, um, and so that that view of Russia um, as, a, as a helper in the uh, post-colonial independence structure, um, 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 struggles of a lot of African states, you know, that legacy is there um, and evident in many people's minds. However, um, let's not forget, um, the Soviet Union also fueled uh, coups and, and violence during the Cold War in many African states as well, and especially over the past years, um, with their deployment of the Wagner Group, uh, the mercenary group, um, they have been actively destabilizing, undermining many African states, contributing to food crises, to migration crises, uh, killing people, committing massacres uh, and atrocities against civilians uh, in states where they're deployed. Um, so, you know, African states are under no illusion that Russia are somehow the good guys. However, they have their own problems, you know, uh, like, like any country uh, or any government. My first priority is my government and my people. 
And so um, in the context of Ukraine, um, the ask to African states can't just be, Russia are the bad guys, we're the good guys, you should be helping us. That's, that's not a political argument. Um, and I think also because of Ukraine's current situation, you're in a wartime condition, there's not much you guys can promise right now uh, that um, at a state level, you know, that, that a partner government um, can really take without a big grain of salt. Because uh, talking about, oh, this is what we're going to do after the war, um, it's good to know. But nobody knows what's going to happen. So, you know, uh, people can't put their chips on that. My, my advice um, and my, my strategy to deal with this would be, quite frankly, to go private sector first. Um, I've done a lot of work over the years um, in you know, African-European uh, uh, business relations, uh, especially focusing on tech innovation. You know, this was sort of my normal work um, that I've been doing the last eight, nine years. Um, and I previously lived and worked in Rwanda. I sit on the board of a pan-African fintech company. Uh, you, you know, so I've, I've been working in this space for a long time. And the, the African um, market, if, if you look at it as a, as a pan-African market, I mean, it's booming, it's growing, it's young, it's hungry, it's dynamic. And if you didn't invest in China 20 years ago, you regret it now. Well, if, if you're not investing in, in African economies today, you will regret it in 10, 20 years. And so I think there's a real opportunity um, from Ukrainian uh, investors, you know, high net worth individuals, companies here, um, in partnership with other European companies, especially Eastern European companies who maybe are underrepresented on the continent, to, to invest in uh, strategic industries like energy, renewable energy, agriculture, and tech innovation, so med tech, ed tech, ag tech, um, investing in those areas where Ukraine has really a lot of expertise um, and, and solid experience, um, and where African companies, African startups likewise, are doing incredible work, and creating win-win partnerships, because companies, especially tech companies, they're more agile, they work faster, um, they can make things happen much faster than at a government-to-government -government level. But those kinds of business partnerships where there's a mutual impact um, and also that sort of soft power of just increasing interaction and getting to know each other and understanding each other's context better, um, while also building stuff that adds value to the economy, creates jobs, solves problems, um, this will be the foundation for for thereafter, for after the war, for when peace comes, um, and give success stories that both African governments and the Ukrainian governments can hold up and say, this is what African-Ukrainian collaboration looks like. This is what we achieve together. Um, and you'll notice I didn't mention grain in any of that. Um, and there's a reason for that, because you know the grain issue is so important um, but right now, with Russia disrupting Ukrainian grain exports and, you know, literally stealing Ukrainian grain and then selling it or giving it away, um, what I don't see uh, is grain as a stable basis for, um, for building the future relationships, because right now it's turning to this, oh, I'll give you this much for this price. No, I'll give you this much for this price. And, and this, sort of, um, this, this sort of silly game that, that Russia is playing to try to win short-term favor, that's not going to build the long-term relations. Um, but investing, for example, in grain storage um, and import uh, capacity uh, in, in, in African port towns, port cities, um, stuff like that, absolutely. Um, but digitalization, renewable energy, uh, and uh, yeah, agriculture, these, these are huge opportunities um, for for paving the way to, to larger Ukrainian-African business ties. And politics will follow business. You know, you, you, you might just have uh, trade delegations and speeches from, at the minister-to-minister -minister level, but at the B2B, at the business-to-business -business level, 
when something's actually there and happening and has been built or a deal's been closed, well, then the ministers will show up too for that photo op, you know? <laughs> so this, um, it's kind of helping wag the dog and build the relationship stronger and showing that, hey, Ukraine understands that, um, that African countries aren't just going to support uh, Ukrainian interests out of the goodness of their heart. There should be a real desire on both sides to, to benefit from a new relationship, to get to know each other, uh, and to pave a path to, to strong African-Ukrainian ties. Well, you know so much about Africa. Uh, and well, since the war started, you fo you've been focused on Ukraine. What was the main driver for you to, to make this decision to refocus your efforts to do this part, uh, to work on this part of the world? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, it wasn't really a conscious decision at the beginning. It was crisis response. Uh, as, a, as a European, as a German, never again means something to me. And I'm not a Eastern Europe specialist uh, or Russia specialist. Um, I've spent most of my career in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. And, um, and I was deeply concerned in, in the winter leading up to the full-scale invasion uh, at the missteps and, and misinterpretations of the situation that I saw uh, happening in Germany. And uh, folks who speak Russian and the so-called Russia experts, the Russland Versteher, the R Russia understanders in, in Germany, uh, were getting it so wrong. Um, and the response was always, oh, but you're not a Russia specialist, so believe us, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and, and um, the thought in my mind was always, well, I may not speak Russian, but I do speak crazy dictator, and I can do math. And this is not a drill. They're not doing this for show. This is serious, and Germany must respond seriously and kind. Um, but when the full-scale invasion came, um, I had only just started um, in the previous weeks to reach out to the Ukrainian uh, diplomatic and uh, civil society community in Berlin, where I live, um, to talk to them about messaging um, with the German uh, public and media. Um, but then it quickly just tipped into crisis response. And actually, um, they, they were asking me to help, for example, with uh, evacuation and getting aid supplies to uh, groups of African students who were stranded um, in cities under attack because I speak French and, and I just have familiarity with you know, the African context. So, so I was just firstly helping in an ad hoc way um, with sort of whack-a-mole requests um, for, for assistance. And because I'm self-employed, I had the flexibility to, to just do that, and I put my normal work on hold. But then as it progressed um, and it became clear that um, NATO in general, and Germany in particular, were not uh, going to step up as quickly as was needed, I just, I just felt this sense of you know, personal um, and civic responsibility that if, um, if I have skills and expertise uh, that could be useful in this situation, as well as the flexibility, because I'm self-employed, um, to, to call time out on my normal work um, and help, well, then I have to. You know, it wasn't even really a, a conscious decision. It, it, just, it just was. It was just what I needed to do, and so I just did it. Um, and um, as I'm sure everyone here uh, shares the feeling, time has also lost all sense of meaning. It just sort of you know, days turned into weeks, turned into months, and now it's been a year and a half, um, and here we are. Um, but I won't stop, because <laughs> I know the Ukrainian people won't stop either, and um, I do truly believe that as Europeans, um, I mean, as humans in general, but especially as Europeans, like, our continent has known nothing but war for 2,000 years almost, or more, <laughs> you know, depending how you want to count it. Um, as Europe, um, and after World War II, we, we managed to create something resembling peace and stability for a little window of time. And I, as a Western European, was born into a time and place where I was safe and free. And I don't take that for granted. So, so that's why I'm doing what I can. Um, and hope that everybody else continues to, too. Well, thank you very much for this 
in the Shock of the Conversation. Uh, this is Open Forum. Please stay with us for more on our YouTube channel. Thank, Thank you. you.